Right. It is 6.05 and I'm calling the select board meeting of June 22nd to order. This is a hybrid meeting. Present in person are Jane Nevin Smith, Joyce Chandler, Molly Keegan. Remotely, we have Randy Eisner and Amy Parsons. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Vernon, and uh, we'll start with the consent agenda. I'm writing like this because I can't get on my board docs. I want to do board docs, I don't want to be on Zoom. So. Do you want to read the consent agenda? Yes. Okay. On the consent agenda, we have ones AP 2251, AP 2251S, PR 2226, resignation from the Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Kayla World, and one day liquor license for Leadfoot Brewing. July 2nd, July 3rd, July 10th, July 30th, and July 31st. Yes. I would like to remove that from the consent agenda, please. The liquor license. All right. I'll make a motion that we approve the once um, and accept the resignation of Kayla Worland from the DEI committee. Um, I'd also like to thank Kayla for her service um, as a volunteer at the committee. Second. Second by Joyce. Roll call vote, please, Jennifer. Roll call vote, Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Iser. Yes. And Keegan. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the one day liquor license. Randy, you have a question on that? Well, again, I don't believe that that should be on the consent agenda. It's something that, uh, as an example, uh, I was at Maple Valley Creamery on Father's Day, and there was uh, Leadfoot Brewery or whatever they're called, Leadfoot Brewing, was there. And I had no idea that they had a license. And I talked to Jane about it earlier, and she told me that, we voted on it on May 18th in the part of the consent agenda, and I completely forgot about it. So I just think something like this is better to get out so that we can at least talk about it for a little bit so that, again, not only us, but the public is aware of what's going on. All right. Well, Patrick Randall is here from Ledford Brewing. Would you like to speak, Patrick? You have a microphone? <laughs> Sure. I'll answer any questions you have. Did you have questions, Randy? Pardon me? Have questions for him. He's asking. Oh, no, no. I have no questions. I understand what's going on. I have no issue with the, the license itself. I, I just want it out in public. Let people know that, again, we don't just issue these licenses willy-nilly there's a process that we go through well I'll, I'll just i'll jump in right here for you the reason we've always typically had them on a consent agenda is because before y'all before they get to y'all i have the building inspector the fire chief and the police chief review all of them sign off and put any conditions upon them that they have um, and at that point they get put on the consent agenda because if Tommy, Mike, and Mike don't have any issues. It's seen as a non-controversial item. And mm -hmm. that's why they've been on the consent agenda in the past. Okay, I understand that. But again, the public doesn't know the process. And even if, if there's a little blurb as to how it goes, it takes an extra five or 10 seconds of the chair's time to explain that, I would be ecstatic. Okay. So we had already approved it at our one of our previous meetings and we knew it was coming. They're here tonight just to accept it. I don't feel like we need to take it off to the consent agenda 
as in other things that are around the consent agenda, if we feel we need a discussion, we can have them. But I don't feel on every liquor license because we come across this every time that UMass football starts their season and they ask us for numerous um, licenses, day, one day licenses for their uh, functions over there. And the public is quite aware of this. And the same thing with having a one day liquor license, it's really not anything that the public is not aware of at this point. So what Randy is asking, let me clarify. You would like to see this simply as an agenda item rather than carry the consent. And there may or may not be any discussion once it is on the agenda and you would vote on it there instead of in carrying the oh. Being, being new to this process, and, and, and uh, I mean, if you guys can convince me that it doesn't make any sense for me to keep doing this, I will uh, consent, if you will. Um, I, I just don't know how it gets out into the public. And one of the things that I was concerned with when I ran was that the public be aware of what happens at our meetings. So that's my concern. If there's a way that we can appease me then we can keep it on the consent agenda. You're one of five though, and I don't think that that's really necessary. I, I just, there's a lot of things on the consent agenda that are there because there are people that see it before us. Mm -hmm. There, I yep. don't feel like there's any reason for it. I understand that, but we are working for the townspeople and I want the townspeople to know what's happening. So Randy, I was on the board when we made the recommendation to put these types of items on the consent And the reason we did it, um, aside from the reasons that were already stated, is the select board knows that if, in order for it to get here, it already had to go through a process of being reviewed by multiple department heads, including the uh, licensing coordinator. And because they come up with such a high degree of frequency, the concern was that we were spending too much time talking about things that were effectively, I'm going to call it perfunctory, um, and not spending enough time talking about some of the other agenda items, um, which require, you know, maybe a little bit more weight and conversation. So, um, I, and I think the fact that it's not really being buried because Jane actually, or the chair, will read all of the items on the consent agenda. So anybody watching the meeting would know that Leadfoot is here tonight for these licenses. So, you know, personally, I'm fine leaving them on the consent agenda. And I think, I think as time wears on, you're going to find out that these are on over and over and over again. Okay. Well, as I as I said, if you can if you can convince me that I'm wasting everybody's time, I'll be happy to stop. Well, I'm going to make a motion to keep it on the consent agenda. Well, it's already, it's already off for tonight, Joyce. I know that, but I'm saying for future things, if it has already gone through the licensing board and everybody has signed off on it, I am making a motion that it remain on the consent agenda. Okay. Indefinitely. Right. I have a second? Second. Second by Amy. Any more discussion? Jennifer? Roll call, please. Okay, roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Uh, Iser? Yes. Again? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to make a motion that we approve the um, one day liquor license for the dates uh, already read by the chair. Second. We have a motion and a second by Joyce. Any further discussion? Jennifer? Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I will have your licenses ready for you on Friday. Okay. Unfortunately, you were the example tonight. So. Okay. No problem. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Thank you very much. Have a good venue. All right. It's time for public comments. Please make the public comments three minutes or less. And um, that you under advisement that we will listen to you, but we will not be discussed this evening. Anybody here for public comment? 
doesn't look like anybody on Zoom is raising their hand. Thank you for checking that. All right, moving into old business. We speed up that. We have um, Bobby here. Do you want me to use the microphone, Jennifer? Oh, it's okay. 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 Um, I just want to say is it on? Oh, yeah. On. Okay. Um, I'm Bobby Cannon. I'm chairperson. Stay with Bobby Cannon. Get you. Save the case. He loves with the hours. Oh. Looking at it. Where do you want me? Let's see. There was moving when we were talking. So. Okay. I can't hear her. How about now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Bobby Kamen, I'm chairperson of the Mosquito Opt Out Committee, uh, which was appointed last fall uh, by the select board uh, in response to the town's vote to opt out of the spring of, uh, for mosquitoes. And I'm here tonight to uh, report and to share with you the letter of approval from the state of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Xander Watson, Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Um, Madam Chair, may I read the letter? Okay. Um, to whom it may concern, National Law Chapter 252, Section 28B2 allows a municipality to apply to opt out of the mosquito. Control Spring, conducted by the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board, SRMCB. For the SRMCB to recognize a municipal opt-out, the municipality must have an alternative mosquito management plan application approved by the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, EEA. Accordingly, EEA reviewed your municipality's application, including your regional risk determination, alternative mosquito management plan, certified vote and checklist. Municipal regional level determination served as EMA's evaluation criteria for the 2022 municipal opt-out applications. Regional risk levels were determined using historical risk level indicators, including the presence of local and regional suitable mosquito habitat and local and regional incidences of positive EEE test results in mosquito samples, animals, and humans. Your municipality was determined to be low regional risk. Given that your municipality prepared an alternative mosquito management plan with specified mosquito control education and outreach activities for residents and submitted a certified vote, your application to opt out of SRMCB spring has been approved. This will be shared with the SRMCB in order to recognize the opt out under statute. Finally, when executing your plan, please be aware that approval of this plan does not relieve an applicant of the need to comply with all applicable federal, state, and local statutes, uh, ordinances, bylaws, regulations. Further, the municipality's opt out does not extend to state owned land within your municipality's borders. Finally, public health outcomes are driven in part by local and scale control actions. We encourage you to review the attached and state control resources to support in implementing best practices throughout the rest of the season. And there is a list um, of all of them, and basically state resources that many of them do not apply to us, but there are many resources. Uh, this, this approval does apply to the um, calendar year 2022. Um, and that's, um, and this is signed by Bethany A. Card, Secretary of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you, committee, for all the work we did on that. Our pleasure, and thank you, Jane, and also I want to thank Susan Mosler from the Board of Health for their support, too. Thank you. Well, 
questions? Discussions? Yes. Yeah, we'll move on. So next we have um, the Berlinski uh, approval for the CPR. The select board was asked to approve the co holder agreement. Uh, this was approved by the May 22nd annual town meeting, and this is the final step as the co holders in the system. The same, I, I'm just going to clear these up. We need to vote on them separately, but the same is true with the Hendrich. So, any questions? Motion to accept the APR payout to Berlinski APR and to the Hendrich APR. Can you make them separate? Was that yeah, please? Let's do first one. So, motion by Lewis. Second. Yes. Second. Second by Mal. Just close it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you took me. Um, Broke Hall for Nevin Smith. Yes. Chelo. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Kaiser. Yes. Ian? Yes. Thank you. All right. Now I will take a motion for the Hendrich APR. Motion to accept the Hendrich APR. And Joyce moved. Second. Second. Second by Randy. Roll call for the Senate. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Tumbleo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Okay. I need you all to come to town hall for your signatures to be notarized for both of these, please. Okay, I can't be there till next week, Jennifer. Um, as soon as you could, would be great, please. Yeah, it'd be Monday. Okay, I'll see you Monday. All right. Thank you. All right, item 4.4, the West Street Commons Park. So this was sort of talked about last week during our meeting. Ago, and it's come up to have a discussion. There are in the, in the town uh, laws, in the town guidelines, I guess, in the select board page, uh, application for use of the historic time. It's a two page document which was um, voted in by the select board in 2018. It was um, presented by the historical commission in terms of trying to keep the um, the commons in its historical use. And so there are lots of different areas that this common gets used. There's the personal use of the residents on West Street. There's occasional use by the town, for instance, the Memorial Day Parade. And then there are people who want to use it for events such as the Asparagus Festival. So in a short period, I think we need to talk about all of those and then we'll, on a longer time, figure out if we need to make any changes to the agreement. So I'm opening this for discussion. I think part of this that was brought up is because people were um, avoiding using the parking signs over toward Eslon and they were parking on the other side of West Street Common and walking across. So that now they're they parked on the other side of the common to avoid parking in the parking lot at Echelon. And so the uh, officers have asked that, you know, maybe we should put signs up on all four corners uh, just to say no parking towards uh, the nine. And I think that was their concern is that you still have uh, people that would obstruct view if you allow them to park on on either side. We don't have as much of a problem on the north side as we do on the south side. I think that's where this parking thing came along as people were concerned about, you know, the parking along that area there. It seems like there was about nine cars towed of recent or tickets were given um, that were parked illegally near the s lot of business. Those are two separate issues. So the use of the town common, right? That's the document that the historical, right? Yeah. I mean, personally, I mean, it's a town common. So I think you know, I would default to the, uh, the original intent is that it's a public gathering space. 
Um, and I would love to see it used as much as um, it reasonably can be, you know, without causing disruption to uh, the West Street neighborhood. And then it seems like the whole well, parking issue is a separate, separate issue unless I'm thinking about that differently. I think I brought it up. I wasn't necessarily bringing up the use of the town common because that has been historically uh, when they do the uh, run in the fall, they usually use the common. At that point, uh, I, the, the I did have a random question, I guess, in regards to the use of the commons. Because <clears throat> I know that we had the asparagus festival and we have other events going on there that we approve. Um, I was wondering though, because I, I know that people will park on the side of it and, and could cause um, destruction to it with vehicles loading, unloading or whatever. Um, do we have any way of, you know, when we approve a contract or a permit per se that, that we do hold um, those outside entities, um, organizations or anybody accountable? Because I know the DPW does a lot of work, but I don't, I'm not entirely sure that it should be their responsibility um, when we do have events from outside um, entities coming in. Is that something that we can put in um, yeah. any agreements that we have? One of the things that's in the application for use of the common is parking slash transportation plans. So there's a section they have to fill out about what they plan to do for parking specifically. And they also pay, a, everyone pays, regardless of whether it's a nonprofit or resident or for-profit, pays a $500 security deposit so that if there's damage done to the town by parking or whatever, um, the town will keep that deposit. And then we would bill them for anything over that five hundred dollars. Should there be any serious issues, we also, Jennifer? We also um, have people carry insurance on our property when they do it. So this Fergus Festival, um, I think it's a million dollars aggregate, and we also make them carry an auto liability as well. So we do have people carry insurance on our property for damage if there's anything in addition to. Um, so th that is in place. As I understand, the $500 deposit is not uh, super great. We did have to um, collect it a couple of years ago where someone had damaged the commons um, with, with their tires and uh, the DPW went out, assessed it and said that it would take a few bags of the special grass, whatever it's called. They're, they're special grass they use on the commons. Um, and so, we um, ended up, I think it was, we kept like $280 from the individual to pay for the grass seed to repair the, the damage that was done. So we have assessed fees and, and used that in the past. Um, so that, that's where we are historically. Okay, thank you. Jim, can I have Yes, Carolyn. Can, can you hear Carolyn? Can you hear me? Me? Not very well. No, not very well. It's on. Push it again. It's on. I'll push it one more time. Okay. There we go. I can probably help with that. And I apologize. I'm coming today in and out of the language like this so I'll do the best I can. So I, I actually put that on the agenda to be addressed uh, because probably within a two or three week period, uh, I had received. Complaints not a separate issue from using the commons. The issue was parking on the commons, alongside the commons, actually using it as personal additional parking space. So not parking parallel to it, but literally pulling in and parking on there. Complaints from various entities, um, as well as um, concerns about usage of larger vehicles going across the commons. So um, having asked uh, for it to go to the program, uh, project coordinator coordination committee, I think there was a lot of discussion and probably it's not going to get solved in one night. Um, my recommendation might be to the bylaw community review is, is getting its first meeting 
on Tuesday. This might be a good place. We probably won't have an answer for several months, but that might be the best place. I think what I learned just from feedback from the committee, the project coordination committee, and this discussion it is just so many different entities. But just to be clear, clarification, it wasn't regarding usage of it, what, what we're talking about right now. So. Well, I think it's a good thing that we're talking about it and being aware of it, but I don't think we need to make any kind of decision. We just need to keep our eye on it for the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that... Yeah, I mean, like for the asparagus festival, people were parked on it and there was trucks parked on it. And, you know, that's what I saw. I mean, they were actually having additional parking right there on the commons. Yeah, that's typical for any big event that we have on the common. It's, uh, parking is everywhere. The, the Memorial Day Parade, the people park on the common. I don't think it's a big deal if it's not uh, abused, meaning used every day kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we want to prevent people from parking on the common, the only way we're going to stop it is to put a fence up around the whole thing because I sat at... Uh, Primo the other day looked across the common and two people pulled right up to the signs that say no parking and parked their cars and got out. So they just don't seem to care. Mike, do you want to speak to this, Mike Mason? Yep. <clears throat> do you have a question about that or what we talked about at the uh, project coordination meeting? So what we what we discussed at that meeting was basically that you know this it's really this up to the select board. Um, the reasons that they put the no parking signs up there was because of damage to the commons, not because of um, you know pe people not wanting people to be able to use the common. Um, and so, really, what it comes down to is is you can put up any any kind of sign you want as the board and and decide you know whatever you want them to say. Uh, the the only thing that I would tell you is that uh, as far as enforcement goes, um, you know, the way that the parking rules that that uh, Jane, you know, brought up at the beginning of this read basically say something along the lines of, uh, you know, can't park there regularly. Uh, I don't know how, uh, you know, our department would be able to find out who's parking there regularly. We're not gonna you know, take pictures of cars and find out how many days a week they're parking there before we ticket them. So it's either all or nothing. Um, it has to be no parking or uh, you have to allow it, uh, or you can allow it just for specific events. Really, you know, it's, it's completely your pleasure. And uh, you know, the discussion that Molly and Joyce were having earlier, I believe was two separate discussions. The only thing that I would be concerned about is where, you know, how far up they go towards route nine. That would be a concern for me. So you have, you know, so you, you can see to pull out. Uh, well, that's a safety in terms of visibility for corners. Yeah. Yep. That's all that would be. As far as parking on the common, I, I have no, no opinion on it. Um, the reason that uh, the only thing that I was able to tell Carolyn about it when she mentioned that she had been getting complaints was that there was a day that uh, last week or a couple of days where they cited several vehicles and actually, I think, towed two. And uh, the lieutenant thought it was quite funny that as he was working his way up the line of cars, writing tickets, um, someone who was parked there saw him, ran out to their car and just simply drove around to the other side of the common and parked where there was no no parking signs. Um, but, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. And there's no damage on that side of the common. So I guess there's no concern. I think that the whole issue started with the consist, continuous that was happening on the side of the common near Esalon that caused us to have that. Now Esalon has added a second lot, so they have a much larger parking area for their customers. So it shouldn't be an issue. Well, the other problem, too, in posting the signs is that the bus was having an issue with site. Um, pulling in and out of West Street on that side. So that was that was the big concern with the bus, uh, not, not having the visibility with the cars parked there. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that um, when this issue did first arise a few weeks back, I actually did take the time to 
uh, speak with a couple of folks who live, you know, on or very near the common. Uh, and several of them have the exact opposite opinion in that, um, you know, nope, there should be no, no parking signs up at all. The common should be for everyone. And they want to see people pulling up and parking and using it, for whatever they want to use it for playing Frisbee or, you know, playing catch with their kids or something. So, you know, just there's two sides to every coin. I believe that it's been a long time. I used to own the property on the <laughs> and I believe that my deed said that I had access to the common because that was the original layout of the land that all the properties around the common would use it for their common grazing. And now my horse has changed to a car and I'm grazing my car on the common by parking there. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> all right, so let's, is it all right to move along? We've got to be out taking the action. All right, moving along. Hi. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting to be at your first hybrid meeting with <laughs> all the technology. And then you can just run it from there, just normal. You're up on the big screen. All right. Am I on this mic? Um, Randy, could you confirm? Can you hear Laura? Randy? Yes, I can. You, you don't need a mic then. <laughs> okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, glad to be with you again. I had come to the select board, I believe it was in April, uh, to give kind of a first overview of a proposed redevelopment of the Econolodge. Um, I know there are several new uh, board members here, and we've advanced our plans a little bit, so it seemed timely to come back and, and see if there's questions. So I'm gonna share a little bit of an online presentation and then happy to take your questions. Okay. So uh, the scope that we've been thinking of for the building, uh, there are 63 uh, hotel rooms, uh, double rooms in the building is to kind of downsize the density a bit to create 51 permanent supportive apartments, 50 for tenants and one for a live-in resident manager. Um, essentially the site would not change. The Econo Lodge sign would be gone, but otherwise we don't see that there, there's much need to tinker with the site. Um, we would combine 24 existing single rooms to create 12 one bedroom units having kitchens. And then we would convert 39 existing rooms to 39 studios by adding kitchens to those rooms. All the rooms currently have full uh, bathrooms. Uh, we would hope to have budget to add solar panels on the main hotel roof and the storage facility roof. Um, this is tiny. Uh, this is the existing site plan from the original permitting for this project. So this building was constructed, I believe in 2003. So it's a relatively new building, uh, about 20 years old. Um, and you're looking at the plans. I guess kind of the point of this is that this property in its development as the Econolodge already went through a full site plan review process with your planning board. Um, this is a sample floor plan. I believe this is the second floor. It's, it's pretty repetitive in terms of how the rooms are laid out as hotels are. So you can see that the rooms as they exist now, they kind of jigsaw puzzle one into the other. Bathrooms are back to back. Um, and then down below is showing a proposal to take some of those rooms kind of scattered randomly and combine them to create a one bedroom apartments. Um, this is looking at what a studio apartment might look like. Um, and they are approximately 257 square feet. So this is a very compact um, living space. Um, but you can see the existing bathrooms and the rest of the room is kind of a big rectangle. Uh, you can see some little kitchen uh, uh, appliances and things are brought in. And this is just giving some samples of how one might lay out furniture in a space of this size. Um, and, oops, to go back. Or I can't go back. Go back. And I'm feeling this big. One more. 
Sorry about that. These are showing, again, the same kind of exercise with the architect, uh, typical one bedroom configuration, essentially creating an adjoining room, adjoining doorway between two uh, next door hotel rooms, taking out one bathroom, creating a kitchen in that area, kind of reusing the plumbing that's there, leaving one bathroom and creating one bedroom and then kind of a kitchen living uh, dining space. And these would be uh, approximately 514 square feet. Um, there are existing accessible units in this building which would be retained as accessible. The common areas, I don't know how many folks have been in this building, um, the largest rectangle that you see um, now contains a pool. Um, we would not want to have a pool due to liability and maintenance concerns. So we would anticipate filling it in to create kind of a large multi-purpose flex space. Um, the same thing with the lobby would be for common area. And then there are several offices that we would use either for staff offices or for, um, we're looking at having a little bit of classroom space, uh, kind of place where people can access digital technology who might not otherwise be able to afford it. Um, there is a commercial laundry <coughs> space hotel that we would convert to a shared uh, laundry room for tenants. And there is um, kind of nice Wi-Fi existing throughout the building, which we would maintain for tenants. Okay, again, decreasing overall density from 63 rooms to 51 apartments, primarily housing single adults or couples, um, targeting 25 apartments to very low income tenants, including a preference for people who are unhoused. And those folks would pay 30% of their income toward rent. Um, 25 apartments for moderate income tenants, up to 60% of the area median income who would pay a fixed rent, but a below market rent. One resident manager unit, and that person would not have an income cap. And then just to give you a sense of who might fit into these income guidelines, we're showing the caps as they stand today for 30% and 60% of the area median income for one person and two people. 30% um, units we, we find in our experience are suitable for retirees, part-time workers and persons with disabilities. 60% uh, units also might house retirees, but often full-time low-wage workers or other kinds of part-time workers. In terms of staffing, we are contemplating one uh, live-in manager, a full-time resident services coordinator, a full-time property manager, part-time maintenance staff, and an on-call overnight uh, crisis service. The support systems that we would want to make available to tenants include these three main areas, uh, educational and vocational advancement, mental health services, and helping people basically become more financially successful or more financially self-sufficient. Um, in terms of that educational and vocational component, um, we want to have a remote classroom. We want to have study, study rooms where people can study at one of our many local colleges um, using remote technology. Uh, we intend to have a scholarship fund for tenants in need to be able to advance their education. Tutors available, um, ESL classes, which is English as a second language, uh, help from the literacy project and various other types of vocational um, training and places. <laughs> In terms of mental health, um, we would look to have support groups, one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, case management, and other types of whatever you need kind of skills for folks um, who are moving from a less stable situation trying to get to a more stable situation. Um, in terms of economic stability, we're already um, equipped to provide on-site or to provide staff for budgeting and financial management. We have a whole kind of small business technical assistance uh, part of Valley, and we would provide tax, tax consulting services as well for self-employed and gig workers. Zoning is an issue that we've talked about quite a bit with the various boards in town. Um, folks may or may not recall that we re were really looking at two primary zoning paths. One is called chapter 40A, which is usually used for educational uses. And one is called 40B, which is pretty exclusive to the creation of affordable housing. Um, I worked with Bill Dwyer, who I think is with us tonight, um, who was extremely um, patient and helpful um, looking at these two options and also consulted with the town attorney. Uh, 40A is the quicker path. Um, it's a little more circumscribed in terms of its definition. The town attorney did not feel totally confident that this was the right zoning path for this project. And so I believe we've come to a mutual understanding and interested to hear if people have opinions uh, on this, that we should follow a chapter 40B zoning path. It is a longer path and I will tell you what it entails. 
Um, one thing it entails is it allows the developer to request waivers from any local bylaws and regulations, which we do through the Zoning Board of Appeals. In this case, the big ticket waiver is to allow a residential use in an industrial zone. Otherwise, there's not a lot of waivers needed because it is an existing use. We're not changing the exterior, we're not changing the site. Uh, the 40B process, Valley, our agency seeks what's called a project eligibility letter uh, from a state housing finance agency. And here's where you come in. It's very helpful to include a letter of support from the municipality. So we'd love to talk with you folks about your comfort level um, providing such a letter. The state agency would come on site. They would look at the site. They would review our proposal. They would formally give the municipality a 30 day comment period where anybody could say anything that they have to say about this proposed project. Um, if the state issues it, then we, it's kind of one of the thresholds we need to meet to apply through the Zoning Board of Appeals under Chapter 40B. And then it's pretty much a negotiated process between the developer and the Zoning Board of Appeals as to what are the nitty gritties. They can put almost anything into that decision, but usually it's by mutual agreement between the parties. Uh, our best case timeline uh, would be to apply for this project eligibility letter next month, uh, to apply for uh, funds to loan funds to acquire the property in September, to hopefully receive this project eligibility letter from the state sometime around October, uh, to actually acquire the property in November, to have zoning hearings and reviews taking place from December through next spring, have a decision sometime next spring, uh, and then seek state financing. Um, and then, you know, depending on how quickly they can move, uh, we'll close on that financing. We're probably looking at about a six month renovation to the building um, and then being able to open and lease up the property. Um, we will be required to do pretty extensive affirmative fair marketing for anything that has public money. So getting the word out to anybody who might be qualified or eligible. And that's me and um, eager to hear if people have questions. I have a few questions. <laughs> um, so is this um, project intended mostly to be as a way for people that are homeless or low income to get back on their feet? That's, that is one of the major goals of the project. I think I would say the other kind of equally important goal for us is kind of workforce housing. So looking at the folks who might be employed in the kind of commercial Route 9 area to have affordable housing. Um, and my other question is you had indicated that there was a vocational offerings, mental health offerings, economic stability, um, offerings for educational purposes. Are those required for people to live there? They are not required. So, um, and it's, pr the state's pretty firm on this point. You can't take people's housing away if they don't participate in a program. So all the programming is voluntary. Um, you hope if you offer good and appropriate programming that people will take advantage of it. So then would you deny people the opportunity to live there on the grounds. So you're saying that you can't take it away from them, but then would you not give it to them in the first place if they're not willing to do that? Not give the housing to them <laughs> or the services? Yeah, I mean, because they would, uh, uh, they apply to live there, right? Correct. So people so have the right to housing whether or not. Say, right, but they have to apply to live there and you have to accept them as an applicant. Is that correct? Correct. So then if they're not willing or not willing to sign anything saying that they would better themselves as an opportunity to remove themselves from their situation, why would you let them in in the first place? Right. So we think that people are more <laughs> likely to be able to better themselves if they're housed. So we wanna give everybody housing we think that's kind of a launch point to be able to partake of other types of self-improvement activities. But the state is, it, it, housing is a protected right, basically. So unless someone is breaking their lease, we're not going to be evicting them. Um, 
and their lease is not able to include a requirement that they use particular services. So you don't have to have mental health services to have housing, even if you might need them. Right, but you're not, I'm not talking about evicting, I'm talking about accepting initial applications. Right. We can't screen out people from coming to live at a place because they do or do not sign a piece of paper saying they will or won't accept services. And then my, my third question was, um, if you really want to get people back on their feet, I mean, any good financial planner will tell you that your housing should be 20% 20, 20 no more than 25% of your income. So why did are you taking 30%? So 30% is in, in both of state and federal um, rental subsidy programs. That, that's the standard that they set is 30% of your gross income for all of your housing costs. So that includes rent and utilities. And do you like find this to be successful in other communities? Very. What was that question? Do we find it to be successful in other communities or other projects? And my answer was yes, we do. Mom, you have any questions? Sure. Yeah. So uh, first, the uh, Housing and Economic Development Committee, um, based on the last presentation that we did, fully supported this project. So I just wanted to make um, the board and the audience aware of that. And so I guess the questions I have are a little bit more of a uh, I want to talk a little bit about financial impact on the town, Laura. Yep. So one of the things that we've discussed in the past is that um, with the conversion to of the Kama Lodge from the hotel to the affordable housing, obviously there's a loss to the town of that hotel tax that we have been enjoying. Um, again, it's the current owner's right to change or at least try to change the use of that property so I mean it doesn't whether it's going to go to affordable housing or theoretically they could have applied to convert to something else. Um, so we understand that that's really not controllable. Um, our understanding is also that you would continue to pay property taxes, correct? Correct. So Affordable housing pays, uh, this type of affordable housing um, would pay taxes according to its assessed value. So one of the questions I had is just, um, and I think there's some consternation about the, the revenue side of the equation, the impact of the town. So has the Valley CDC in the past ever worked at any sort of um, upfront, maybe one-time community impact agreement where you might consider, again, understand it can't be on an ongoing basis and that would make sense that you're, uh, making an annual operating payment or something like that. But would you consider um, working out something with the town where you might be able to do something in the context of uh, whether it's public safety or board of health or? Yeah, I, it's, it's a pretty negotiable process, um, the comp permit. Um, other communities tend to have not so much project by project, but they have standards for impact. So, for example, in Northampton, there's always a traffic analysis and traffic mitigation. You might have to pay for traffic mitigation. You might have to pay because you're removing trees. Um, so certainly we could we can look at that. Um, best practices might be to have a something that applies to all kinds of projects, not just to one specific project. Um, I would just add the current hotel owner who owns other hotels in Hadley, projects that there would not be a, a net loss of revenue, hotel revenue, because the hotels are not operating at capacity. And his feeling is that this is a destination related to the colleges and that what will happen is if the Kana Lodge is not there, you will simply have a higher occupancy rate at the other hotels that are in Hadley, which actually costs more. You could potentially see a bump in revenue. Again, I'm not in the hotel business, so I can't say if that's accurate or not, um, but it's not a one for one loss because it's true. If people want to come and stay in the area. If one hotel leaves, they will, they will go to another hotel in the area. And so you still may capture that same revenue stream from people who are coming here specifically to come here. So sounds like then you'd be open-minded if, if the select board 
you know, wants to at least maybe come to the table and have a conversation about some sort of community payment or whatever that might be. Um, coverage of some piece of equipment, but, I mean, whatever we might talk about, we are at least open minded to having that conversation. I have a couple. Um, one of the things is, is that do you feel like this may cause uh, any other problems with the type of clientele that we might have living there as in like the nights have brought people over and they're living in a motel, hotel here on the night, which we've had, you know, several calls from our police. Um, wondering in the future, what it might bring to our infrastructure for police and fire. Right. When green leaves went in, I think the fire department makes daily runs down there for yeah. whatever, yeah. whether it's a smoke detector going off or if it's somebody that needs some help getting up, which is what yeah. we're here for. Sure. Um, and I'm just wondering with this yeah. type of clientele, do you think that yeah. we might need, you know, it's going to be two years down the road anyway sure. that we're looking at this, that there yeah. might be other, other things that we might need look at yeah. infrastructure. Um, I wouldn't anticipate you have to change your staffing public safety plan for your town. Would it generate calls, 911 calls? Yeah, I mean, it's our job to make sure that's not an undue number of calls. Um, and that's why one of the slides that I prepared focused mm -hmm. on staffing, because my belief is it's really about having good management um, I've talked with the police chief, I've talked with the fire chief, some of them, some reps are here tonight and they can speak for themselves, but did not, it did not raise any alarm bells. Um, in terms of the, the fire department being called, it has a lot to do with the infrastructure itself in the building, not the town's infrastructure, but when you have an antiquated building um, that's tripping alarms, that's, that's problematic. Um, this is a pretty new building with sprinklers and, a, you know, a hardwired fire alarm system. So we would hope not to have that particular kind of problem. Um, but yeah, I would say we own other housing that houses people coming out of homelessness, people who are vulnerable, people who are low income. And we definitely see a bump in public safety calls, but it's not outrageous. Um, it's it's higher than a t typical per capita would be. We had a lot of discussion around this. When we and I'm not pinpointing yeah. or pointing fingers at anybody, but we do have a lot of um, <coughs> issues with our in the medical field ourselves. That there's a lot of mental health issues right now, um, yeah. and our emergency rooms are overrun with yeah. you know, mental health problems. Yeah. Um, in Northampton, my dad lived in Four Sands Apartments uh, in Florence, um, and they had issues there, yep. I can say, and that was a long time ago compared to yep. even now what is has increased to as this kind of street. I don't know where your facilities are. Are there in Northampton? We have several in Northampton. We have one in Amherst and another one actually under construction now in Amherst. And what I would say we've seen as a pattern is I think there are more high need folks in our mm -hmm. world. I think there are more high need tenants and so our response has been increased levels of support and staffing. You know, when we started building housing for people who are homeless, we were like, it's housing. Like, that's all they need. It's just off the street into housing. Everything's good. And sometimes it is. Sometimes that's true. Someone literally just needs a place to live. But it's not always true. And so our sense is that permanent supportive housing, which is this model, is extremely successful at keeping people out of emergency room um, and 911 circumstances. Like that's the whole point of it is to take folks that are kind of spiraling and using a, a lot of public services and stabilize them. I know we have met already our um, your 10 percent. 10 percent. Yep. We're above 10 percent. You're above 10 percent. 14 percent. And there was some discussion with, with the planning board about properties that were coming off of that inventory and some strategic thinking on the part of the town about wanting to keep that 10% level going forward. Does Bill feel like you want to, you know what our percentage is right now for low income housing? <coughs> I, 
believe we're uh, between 12 and 13 percent at the moment. Uh, a certain number of the uh, the properties over uh, in the uh, it's changed its name now. Um, Vesta or Campus Plaza? The one across from uh, across the street, um, the one in one in back. Um, when, it was Winfield, but it's something else now. Uh, a certain number of those. Those are scheduled to come off the inventory when their financing is paid off. Um, so um, you know, we're trying to keep an eye on on staying above the uh, ten percent. And this project is proposing that the um, the units will be perpetually restricted. The Winfield project was only restricted for the life of the loan they. Uh, they had to, to build it. We may be able to do some work about extending that. Uh, I believe David Nixon was able to get an extension of the apartments on uh, the Stop and Shop Access Road for a few years, um, but they're also coming off at some point. So this is a proactive way to add to our inventory of affordable housing. Um, with a perpetual cap on it or perpetual no, or limit on it in a space that's already property that's already developed in um, on a street that's already busy. Thank you. Okay. Randy. Two questions, please. Um, after you were to do your renovations, Laura, do you have any idea how that will impact the assessed value of the building? Yeah. Um, Usually the assessed value is done based on the revenue stream. So it's a return on investment formula that the assessors would do. So it's really about the rents that are coming in and the expenses of operating the property, <clears throat> which is the same way that I would assume the assessors look at the building now. It's not so much the, the cost of building it. It is what does it generate as a business? And so what is its assessed value as a business income stream? Um, when we did an appraisal of the property, they looked at it the same way. They looked at occupancy, revenue, net, net earnings, and they backed into return on investment. And that became the um, assessed appraised value of the property. So okay, they thank you. Sense. Okay, and are you going to limit the number of people that will be allowed in a unit? Yes. So um, typically a studio is for one person. I'd have to look again at the Board of Health. There are state Board of Health requirements in terms of how much square footage you need per person in a unit. So you might be able to have two people. We typically just advertise them for one person because they are so small. And then I think the one bedrooms would also mostly have one person, but they can accommodate a couple. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Is there any way, and I, the answer is probably no, but to... Uh, because it's in Hadley, offer the Hadley residents who are looking to downsize before opening it to the public? Yeah. So, um, again, once you get state funding, you kind of play by state rules. Um, they do allow towns to request what's called local preference. Um, it's something the town would request um, as part of that 40B comprehensive permit process. Um, and they cap it at 70% of the units and it's only during the initial lease up of the property. Um, and you have to make an argument that you have the demand in your community for those units to get um, approval for local preference. Okay. Thank you. So I wanna keep moving on the agenda. Is there any more questions for Laura while she's here? Laura, at some point you, you mentioned in your slide presentation, the letter of support. Yep. Is that something you're requesting tonight or? Yeah, if the board feels prepared to talk about it and, and you think you can do that or allow the Housing and Economic Development Committee to do a letter, it could come from either body. I think for the actual letter, we should just put it on our next agenda. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Thank you for so much time. Thank you. And thanks for, for coming back and giving us a more detailed update. You're welcome.
Some documents. I can pull up. I can share them if you'd like. Scott, go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. All. <clears throat> yeah, I've been talking to Carolyn about uh, increasing our scope of work on South Maple Street uh, and our current Route Nine plans. We are doing some uh, water main work there, uh, and with, with all the trouble we've been having in that area water quality, fire protection, et cetera. Uh, we were, have been talking to the contractor about extending our scope of work through uh, the current contract. Uh, and we were looking at replacing 1,320 feet of water main, which would go fr from almost a bike, bike path to the intersection of Mill Valley Road. Uh, in doing doing that, uh, we'd be piggybacking off of our current uh, agreement, so we wouldn't have to go out to any kind of bidding or anything of that nature. And as Carolyn explained, I have been working with the contractor and Mass DLT on this, and and this is kind of uh, this just the thirteen hundred and twenty feet is just the tip of the iceberg with this, but it is. I guess a once in a lifetime opportunity for us because it's the design phase, which normally would cost us a uh, considerable amount of money has been uh, looked at by the state and the contractor. So we're, we're saving right out of the gate with this going to that distance. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I don't know how to, ask for the, you know, Carol, we've been talking about the money and et cetera. And, and this is just, this would be huge for this area uh, to get some good fire protection and just get some, a good uh, path for the future of continuation also, because uh, the design is the way it's designed. We can easily continue further with uh, relative, relatively easy uh, continuation, but obviously that would have to be designed and gone through all that. But in this particular circumstance, uh, we we were, I talked to uh, uh, Mr. Goulet uh, because we want us to uh, 
not impact the road. We want to put our pipe off the road. And there's some other, there's a high pressure gas main there that we have to stay so many feet away from. And we'd be encroaching a little bit on Mr. Goulet's property. And he is willing to work with us on that. Uh, as part of this, he, he is a big fan of this. He, he wants to see this happen. Uh, and just, it would benefit everyone in a huge way. Uh, just it, and it would help out the, uh, the new building that's being built there because they're looking at trying to get uh, water for fire protection at that building. That's like the ideal yes. Sure. And that hasn't been really thoroughly hashed out yet of how that's happening. If, if we could do this, we could, you know, we would go past their property and leave them a proper connection that they could hook on to. So it, it, it would really be a win for everyone in the area. Uh, it, it is something that unfortunately uh, we have to kind of make a decision on uh, for material wise. That's the biggest, I think the materials might be even harder to uh, come by than the money. Uh, it, the, the time frame is crazy on materials. So if this is something we wanted to do, we kind of have to uh, a yay or nay decision on because they have to order the materials because uh, they're looking to get started on this project uh, after the 4th of July uh, out here in front of the uh, this Legion area and then skipping where they ever need to go. But it's something that we need to look at and it would give ideal movers some kind of uh, decision on what their next step is to it. There's, there's a lot of things in lingo with this, uh, us doing this. So just to add to this, um, about a month and a half ago, we got notice from the Division of Local Services that a grant that um, I had written a year ago had been denied, which was, if you remember, tell me when the approval was to uh, um, borrow for the replacement of the water lines on Route 9 and sewer lines. Um, but it was, you know, I was hopeful that we would get this grant, but it was denied. But um, we were we did find out from the uh, division of local services that if the forward funding, this is another part of our our broad issue, say two or three, um, when the when the uh, state budget passes, it's very likely that they would in fact be funding them for a million dollars. This is where we got really excited and said, "Wow, this is awesome!" Because this additional scope of work is about four hundred and fifty, and this would have been just a, a win win situation. So, uh, but I have found that even up to about 20 minutes ago, that funding will, the state budget does not look like it's going to get approved into the midsummer. So um, I do, I, I still want you to see some of the work that was done behind the scenes. And so um, behind the scenes, we need the finance team working hard trying to find this. So Linda, can you kind of give a summary of what we were hopeful for, but realize we don't have authorization to spend this money until town meeting? Right. Um, yeah, I hope I'm not repeating. I had a little trouble hearing um, the opening of this. Um, yeah, we were, so this goes back to, we approved um, an annual town meeting of 21, um, the $805,000 to do the water lines, um, piggybacking on the Mass DOT project, the, the main part of Route 9, the primary project that we were always talking about. So we have authorization from town meeting uh, to borrow $805,000 for this project. Also, that's on water. And there was also $120,000 on sewer. And so since that, it, and money was requested at that time, but we didn't get it. Um, and this time it looks like we're going to get a million dollars, which makes it look like um, which basically covers that initial project in full. We wouldn't need to borrow that any of the money that was approved at town meeting. But rather than turn that back, um, there is this opportunity to solve a longstanding problem, as uh, as Scott has has uh, explained well, and Carolyn's uh, Scott and Carolyn know more about the work part of it than I do. But um, we also know that we've gotten complaints from that uh, that section of town about what's going on with our water. And it be a, a, seems like a really nice way to resolve, uh, to, to settle um, 
to take care of that at the same time. So with this additional project adding 500,000, we don't have the $5,000 authorized to spend on this except for the million dollars. So this is the bind that we find ourselves in. Um, there is a hearing later this week um, uh, on, on the bill before, uh, before the state um, uh, for the forward bill and approving uh, the money. I think it's $2.3 billion in all almost about $2.3 billion of which Hadley gets a million dollars for this Route 9 project. But we don't have it right now because it hasn't been approved yet. So we, and we need to come up with the approval in the short run. So we started trying to figure out how we could put some pieces together. How can we get there as if we weren't getting the million dollars? And um, normally these are fun things, but we're kind of running out of pockets. Um, ARPA money, uh, that we have, the total amount that we received, we really only have about $150,000 left to throw at this project. And that's if we squeeze a bit more on uh, maybe the trailers won't run in as much, maybe the other, um, uh, maybe the other infrastructure projects that were approved aren't going to cost quite so much. Let's say we could even get another 50000 out of it. We would still be short, um, short a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, so, so we did come up with some creative things and I'll spare you on that about just to, just to tell you, we do get pretty creative uh, about how we can get some money, and that, but then we have to talk to our accountant who, um, who is, knows what we can and can't do without authorization. And in fact, she, she is on, I don't know that we need her for this, but she's on, uh, Lori Delolio is on now. We, Carolyn and I spoke with her this afternoon and, and shot down some of our ideas. But I think the one that is remaining, well, first of all, if we, we could hear in the next couple of weeks, we get this million dollars. So our local politicians, if you have any way that you can talk to our, our state representatives and get that bill passed, that would be ideal because then we wouldn't be in this problem. At, we wouldn't be in this uh, pickle at all. But if we don't get that in the next couple of weeks, the only remaining solution that we can find is to go ahead and um, is to ask that you schedule a special town meeting um, or maybe a one article town meeting that we have uh, on a few weeks notice to get enough people in to approve this project. Um, it would need to be, if we put it in to be borrowed, to be paid out of water receipts, we know right now we have $1.2 million in water reserves. There's the money to do that, but we can't spend the water reserves on this because after June 30th, the money won't be certified. So it's a borrowing thing. So it's really your call as to whether the, I know it's a, it's a nuisance and there's a bit of an expense. Jessica says it's not as high as expense as going to um, having an extra election, but, um, but that seems to be the only way that we could have actual authorization in hand so that when Carolyn and Scott need to tell them, yes, it's a go that we would have the, we would be, legitimate in saying that. So, so the question's better posed to Scott. So the $448,000 that would be required to make this project happen, how much would we, would we be saving what would it otherwise cost in the absence of what you've been able to work out with? I don't have a, I would, I don't have a real number on that for you because like I said, the design and everything was done in their good graces to uh, try to help uh, help the town out that they're already working here. So they took this on for no expense. So I, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you, I, engineering is very expensive. It's a, it's, a, it's a bigger number than what it would cost us to schedule a special town meeting. Yes, be, uh, yes. Uh, the engineering cost, mobilization charges, things that go on that they're already here working. Uh, uh, bid docs and all that things that uh, uh, Jennifer would be involved in with the, the whole process would change. We'd have to go out for a, a total uh, uh, change of the scope of work. I mean, it would it would be massive and time and time consuming to prepare the bid docs, and we'd have to go out to bid for the engineers to do the engineering for us. And it, it, it's not just the one going out to bid; it would be the two. 
because you'd have to have an engineer write your script report. All right, I move that we call special town meeting to vote on this reform article. Um, I, uh, I'll second that for discussion. Okay, I have a motion in a second for the discussion. It seems like, uh, and, and maybe to your point, Jane, we need to run a, a kind of a bifurcating path. So, well, trifurcating, because I'm sure we're just going to keep thinking about creative ways to find money. But if the two paths forward right now would be to go to the special town meeting, and the other one is to do everything we can to get our state, to, to get behind our state legislators to push this forward. I mean, that's the the easy thing to have happen, right? Um, and but the, does the timing on that work? I mean, I have no problem calling Dan Carey and Simon Joe Comerford are the two offices that we'd be calling. Is that right? I'm just looking at when it's going to be. That was the second of July. The way the unconscious came to give us the final version, it's got to be in her June 30th, although it's sometime at the end of July by the time we have your sons, it kind of becomes official, so it's at the end of June. Okay, with that timing, does that even work? Well, his current bid is only good for 30 days, so that, uh, so the, the, the volatility of materials is crazy. So they, no one holds any pricing for a long term. Uh, so Scott, 30 days starting when? Uh, from June 8th. So we got July 8th. So if we, to, if we had a special town related to appropriate the transfer from the reserves and the money came in from the state, could we then replenish or not? We, we can't actually move money from reserves after June 30th because uh, even though we have 1.2 million in right now, if we had a special time meeting next week, we could spend it. But remember, it, it, it goes away and has to be recertified as of July 1st. So we actually don't have any money to spend first week in July. And I don't think we can get it in before the end of June. And I'm not sure that's a good idea if we if we have still have this possibility of getting the million dollars anyways. I don't know that we want to schedule it that quickly. I didn't know we had 30 days from June 8th. So everything kind of changes the picture a little bit. Um, no short term. Yeah, I it's not a matter of ha of having the money to do it. It's the authorization to spend the money. We're looking for the authorization from town meeting or the only source that we don't need authorization from, except through the select board, is um, is the ARPA funds. So, and we only have about one hundred fifty thousand of that um, so left. On an alternative thought. What if we ordered the materials? Would the ARPA funds cover those if the contract doesn't go through? He, does, he doesn't have the bid broke down like that. I'm not sure exactly uh, what the material price is. It's just uh, priced out as the job. But to James' point, is there a way to chop it up into pieces? Yeah. I agree with that. I was thinking the exact same thing Jane just said. If we could, if we have enough money to buy the materials, and that's the concern, because I don't think they're going to start construction on this in 30 days. Uh, uh, if we no. had materials, yeah, if we had materials in hand and not have to worry about that, not being able to get them, number one, or price increase, number two, then we can, <coughs> we have some more time to figure out how to pay for the actual construction costs. Yes, okay, I, I, I appreciate that, that motion. I do think we um, need to get financing capital to be on this as well. So I, I guess I would want to make... I'll withdraw the motion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. 
Yeah, and we just we just really just today uh, we were a little bit more helpful. So and just for one more time, this is just the tip of the iceberg for a half a million dollars. Uh, so just picture that in your minds that it's costing us to go from the white path to that intersection, half a million dollars. Never mind, you know, going down Mill Valley to the Parsons Farm or continuing to Bay Road. Uh, this is a long term, very expensive project, but it is an excellent start. Sure. Can somebody just remind me where, where, where did the ARPA money go? Linda has the whole book, right? <laughs> um, oops, wrong one. Sorry. So we had we were our total uh, amount was one point five six million dollars. Um, we used about five hundred, almost five hundred eighty thousand of it towards the FY twenty two budget, and we have. Uh, Allocated four hundred thousand of it for the twenty three budget. That brings us down to five hundred eighty three, five hundred eighty four thousand. Um, so the non budgeted expenses we have um, DPW water sewer infrastructure. There's how many projects? Uh, the culvert few. I think it's two or three projects. More than that, Scott. That basically three hundred thousand dollars was. Uh, authorized by select board to spend on water sewer infrastructure projects. Is that accurate S still, Scott, that the 300,000? Uh, yes, but I think the 300,000 may be uh, a, a little on the high side. I'm still uh, working on closing out uh, okay. current ones that we did to get more accurate uh, numbers as the uh, uh, bills come in because we did that one was an emergency and we really uh, our procurement was uh, waived so we didn't it was uh, time and material by a lot of people and they're just uh, coming in now with their uh, bills so we're uh, we're processing all that right now so uh, in the next week to 10 days I think we'll have a, a much better uh, idea of where we are Okay, then we can work on that. But it's possible, or if there's something that hasn't been done there, it's possible that we could grab some, get some money back out of that 300. I'm not sure this is going to solve the problem, but we do what we, we do what we can. Um, but assuming that we don't get any back from that, that 300,000 for those infrastructure projects uh, brings us down to 284,000. We have 100,000 100, was allocated out of our ARPA funds for the DPW trailers. Um, that's in addition to a hundred thousand that was now, has this been definitely approved Carolyn for DPW that, I mean, DO, uh, state has approved hundred an, an extra hundred thousand for the trailers. And, and, and we, and we may not need the full 200 between the two. So we might be looking at maybe getting 20,000 back from that. Uh, we had you. You had your street lights project that we are advancing some of the money. I have that down at forty thousand. Um, I don't know if that's if we get that forty thousand. Is that the forty thousand we get back, Carolyn? The what, what yep. we? We're gonna. Um, no, we're taking. Yeah, I think it was forty or forty-five to purchase. We are getting about thirty back, but we can't reimburse our money. Okay, so anyways, using the 40,000 where that leaves us 144,000. If I add some of those things back, you know, we still don't, we probably still have less than 200,000 available. So it's more like 150 maybe to, well, it could be 200,000, depending on how much comes back out of. So we could have 200,000 to put at this, at the project. I was estimating the, pro I mean, I was using a $500,000 figure for the, for the project. Um, but Scott, you're, your figure was, you said it was 448? 448, but that doesn't include, as we were talking yesterday, uh, uh, the police uh, de uh, details are not included in that and uh, uh, removal of two trees, but that's uh, relatively minor. But I think the, pol the police details are going to be uh, the most expensive uh, part, and I'm not sure 
uh, what their time frame is on that or what, what his man, what he's thinking his hours are, I guess. Like I said, his quote's not broke down like that. I, okay, I, right. I, I, I would imagine this would be, you know, three, four week minimal project. It's, it's got and times uh, uh, two officers, eight hours a day. So when that times, I believe the current rates 55 or $54 an hour. So that's, that's going to add up fast. Right. And Lori, I see Lori's on, I think in the small, Lori, PREPA funds, we, we can reimburse or not. I didn't hear the question. That we get the 40, that you're talking about the streetlights money? Yes. So when we get that money back, it goes, it, Carolyn. does it go to, Lori, when, yeah, when, when we get the ARPA money back on the reimbursement on the streetlights, it has to go back to ARPA? Correct. Okay, so it would be available to us again. All right, so see, we're finding a little more money, but we're still a couple hundred thousand dollars short. It seems we're so close. So <laughs> And if we get this million, you know, we don't even have to borrow all the money or we'll find another project, I guess. I mean, we'll extend it some further. I don't know. So we're just stuck in this. So why don't we put this on our next agenda and see where we are? Maybe there'll be good news. And hopefully it will be good news. Everybody, please call your representative and state senator and ask them to move this bill forward. Yeah, and if possible, Scott, if you can get a breakdown from Baltazar, that would be extremely helpful. Yeah, I, I can uh, ask him for that, Randy. I'm sure that's not going to be a problem. Thank you. Is the um, bill reference number in an email to someone? Or could it be someone to call? We have the reference for the funding. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's information. Okay. Thank All you. right. It's remind me. All right, moving along, Scott, you're also going to talk about cemetery loan contracts. Yeah. yeah. Scott and I opened the bids together, but I did the I did the follow-up. So we went out to bid uh, for cemetery mowing for the five cemeteries. Um, we did receive um, a couple of bids. Uh, Omasta was the uh, best bid that we received, and we are recommending that we award the bid to a master landscaping. So I have a motion to accept the results of the recommendation from the third one. So moved. Second, I moved it, go ahead. I moved. Oh, Amy seconds. Okay. Yes, I guess I'll be the louder. Put your microphone on. I don't know. Roll call? Yes. Evan Smith? Yes. Chandler? Sure. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Bring up some no. We used to have actual motions that they would read, and I'm just worried that it's gotten somewhat loose in that regard so that when motions are made, it may not be as clear as we need them to be. So is that something we could work on maybe getting it into the I know you don't always know what most stuff to think, but I'm, I I I Carolyn and I have been I do want to do Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're work, we're working up to it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. She okay. she's big you fan. Know, we can't do it with the board docs and have the same thing that the motion in front of us. Uh, you can do, yeah, you can swing by with throw them out the car. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on. Scott, thank you. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for Harkness to for uh, the lower end of uh, 47. It looks really nice. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that, yeah, that was completed uh, last Friday. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. All right, moving right along to the IT management spanish services. Oh. Okay. I am. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, the town um, has had a very successful long-term relationship with Northeast IT, uh, but the contract had ended. We could not renew it any longer. We went out to bid again. 
Um, we received about 10 requests from um, IT companies. We only received two bids, but they were from two qualified companies. Um, Carolyn and I reviewed the bids and um, then opened the price proposals. And we have decided that IT, Northeast IT is the company that we should award the bid to again. Um, just to give you a little information, um, they were about $10,000 cheaper than the other company. Um, and they're for a year, it's $48,000. They did go up on some stuff like everybody else. Um, there's some extra costs that weren't there um, in the past. Um, one of them being, what is a supported user? Um, that price has gone up from uh, 70, 65 to 85. Um, and that's what's actually caused that little bump is the fact that we added three extra users in the last year. So that's why we're going from 45 to 48. Um, so that is the recommendation that Carolyn, if I can say that, that we, we did as the evaluators and, and we are, we've been very satisfied with them. So I feel like it's a good relationship for the town to continue. Motion to award the managed IT services for the town of Bradley to Northeast IT Consulting. Second. Randy, that's second. All right. Any other discussion? Yeah, we'll call the vote, please. <laughs> we'll call the Nepesta? Yes. Chungler? <clears throat> Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Thank you. All right. The Council on Aging Part Time Administrative Assistant. Um, there's a change from what you see on the board documents there. Okay. Um, so the Council on Aging has offered the position to Leslie Owen, and she is willing to start 19 hours a week on July 7th. And so we need to approve that. Give me just two seconds, because th this one actually has a motion built into it, and I just want to always see that. Okay. Recommended action. Will you change Kelly Curtis's name? Please? It is. If you'll, if you hit refresh, you'll see it. Do we really need to approve a part-time administrative that can't be delegated? Yeah, it just seems like there's some delegation authority to the whole Okay. Maybe we can clarify that something. All right. I have a motion and a second. I, I, I didn't get a motion or a second. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Is there a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the recommendation of the Council on Aging Director to hire Leslie Owen as our new COA, part time administrative assistant, uh, working 19 hours a week at a rate of $19 per hour. Second. 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 We'll call the yeah. Nevin Smith, yes. Chungalu, yes. Parsons, yes. Iser, yes. Again, yes. Thank you. All right, 5.5, board and committee reappointments. Okay. This is an annual event that happens. Um, unfortunately, not all of the committees have returned their lists. So I think we should just postpone this to our next meeting. I actually would like you to go ahead and appoint everybody that's on the list here. Um, and because it, 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 for some reason this year we had difficulties returning the forms. Um, I got them by text and by uh, picture and on Google Docs and all sorts of different ways. It was it was a bit of a opening and unfortunately several of the committees did not respond to my request. Um, but um, I actually can't open it on my computer. Um, but it is a pretty full and robust list. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I just want to, I'm going to politely disagree. That's um, not a full that and robust list. That we do it tonight. Oh, okay. okay. And the reason being that um, because it was a work in progress, and again, that's not on you that people didn't get back to you. So, um, so I know that you were trying to get people to respond. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that, um, 
could be wrong, but I think there was a little bit of a problem last year when this got rushed through a bit. And so, for example, I had a phone call from somebody who went to the town report that said, oh, I see there's a vacancy on the ambulance committee. So I think we need to do a reconciliation between what went into the, is in the town report, what's on here, because on here it doesn't show that there's a vacancy. I wasn't aware that there's a vacancy. I think our service online, there's a vacancy. And the reason you don't see it on there is because this is just the people who are due for reappointment. This is not a full list. This is literally the people who are due for reappointment and new members. That's it. It's not, I don't have everybody on there because otherwise it would be multiple pages long. So I send out the requests with all the people that are on their board and say, these people are highlighted in yellow. Please confirm that they wish to remain and they respond is how it goes in theory. Mm -hmm. um, because for, for example, the ambulance committee, I knew you were saying, I knew you were saying, I knew Mike was saying, Barbara Connor was a, a known, and I knew there was a vacancy. Well, she's not a you, you said yeah, that at six o'clock. It was just not until. Right. So, um, so the reason why it's not a full and complete list is because this is the reappointments. So I only put the people on there who are being reappointed. So is there, is there, I mean, what's the doubt? If we don't approve it tonight, we just put it on another meeting. Okay. You just, I just, it, it's so last minute. I haven't had a chance to really. Okay. That's all. That's fine. Okay. June 30th. Well, that's our next agenda. I'm going to make a motion to accept the list that you have given us tonight on the reappointments of the <laughs> annual people for the. Uh, Could I ask? Meeting for the board and committee reappointment. Can I ask if this does not mean that no one else is going to be appointed to anything? I don't know how you would phrase that, but this isn't kicking anybody off of anything. It's just the, these people on this list are being appointed. And there will be an addendum yes. uh, to uh, the list at the next meeting. Okay. Second. Amy? Any discussion? Yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, I think we need to, again, it's just an area that we need to button up. It's just gotten really loose. Um, I don't know what the process is for, you know, it says new member. I don't know if there were multiple people that asked to be on a committee and only one went on there. I mean, all of that stuff. Okay. It just, there's no, okay. I mean, I think the committee assignments are important um, and I don't, you know, I don't want anybody to get short shrift. Those, those people that were just appointed were... There were new members on there because... New members it, because the other ones had resigned. And the cultural council, they have to resign. They can't go again. So five years, um, they do their five years. They can't stay any longer. So those three openings were filled by three people. Um, and the Housing and Economic Development Committee was by the person who had contacted you. Yep. Um, and I'm sorry, for some reason, this computer won't let me open... Um, this on here. So I can't, I literally can't look at my own list to discuss it in full. But if you, it's a, whatever your pleasure is, is what I will do. And I can make it a more complete list for next time, or I can bring this list back with the additional list next time. Y'all can vote on all of them again. It's whatever, whatever works. Yeah, Jennifer, <laughs> um, to Molly's question, were there more than, were there multiple applicants for a position in other words were there more people than applied that we have openings for no okay okay thank you thank you volunteer. We appreciate that um i'm really mixed and i think molly's right we need to get this for next year organized in a better way and we don't need to wait till the last minute we need to figure out a system but I think that we should honor those people who have turned their requests in to be reappointed and encourage all those who have not done that yet to please do it as soon as possible. Yeah, and to, uh, the, the last minute detail stuff, I, I get and I, I, 
I'm not going to you know, blame Jennifer for this because I know people don't reapply when they're supposed to. They have months or whatever, and they wait till the last minute. And as she said, she's got it coming at her from 15 different directions. So I agree with Jane. We just approve what she's got for tonight and we deal with the rest when it comes in. <clears throat> Any further discussion? No. Oh, all right. Jen. 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 Um, roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Again. Spirit of unanimity, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would ask if in particular, the Climate Change Committee and the Shade Tree Committee could please get their responses back to me. That would be super helpful. Um, uh, hey, Jennifer, I sent it to you on the 20th. I emailed it to you. I had I have it in my email files. I sent it right back to you the morning of the 20th. So if you check your email, you'll, you should find it. I, I super check my email every day. And when I saw you popped on, I checked my email and I, I don't have an email from you. So if you could resend it, that would be really great. But thank you. All right. Jane, Jane, it's changes every five minutes. Um, I think it's something that is to put on a future agenda because I think it could be a process that I think I can help with because I think you, I think you actually need some documentation to be filled in because I, I found her point today. She got texts, she got PDFs that she couldn't copy and paste, and it, it comes with all different pictures and sent. So I do think there's a way that we could do this much smoother and take the stress off of Jennifer as well. And, it, and then you have new applicants, maybe even meet with them. And there's no reason that we can't have these lists turned in by the end of May. And FYI, every tackle service, okay. you are not unique. All right. All right, so let's put this on, not next to the agenda, but down the road a couple. Well, you, it'll be on again for y'all to finish everybody else, yeah. Because, like, Jack's going to resend me his. Looking and, at the process, we need to put that. Like, you got it. Committee process, absolutely. All right, so I'm going to be scheduled. I would propose that we would meet not the week of July 6th because it's a holiday week and a lot of people are away. Myself, that we meet next week and that way we can legally appoint people to committees within the appropriate time. Hopefully, it would be short week. And then we'll meet again for either the first or the second week, or the second or the third week in July. And Jessica, if you have time, I just resent it from the other day. Right, so Jack, I think that might be where the problem is. My name is Jennifer and my email is info at hadleyma.org. And Jessica is the town clerk and her email is clerk at hadleyma.org. Okay. All right. I got you. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> That probably is why I did not get the title change. All right, so we need a, a, a systematic form that we're going to send. We, we have, we have the. All right, but okay. we'll hey, fix hi it. Hi, everybody. Can I just say, I'm Laurie. I'm the town accountant. I just wanted to, while you guys are planning your meetings, we're going to probably have to do an end of year transfer meeting with the FinCom and the Board of Selectmen. So I just want, if you're up, you know, planning your upcoming meetings, I just want to get that on your agenda. So that would be next week. Uh, yeah. Well, you meet every two weeks typically. We every two weeks on Wednesday. Yes. First and third. First and third. But I'm proposing not the first for July, and we can either move it back a week for the end of June or forward. I mean, yeah. if our meetings are going to continue to be two and a half, three hours long then um, maybe we should have one next week to kind of catch up on this. The finance 
the finance piece of it will be quick. I can just have something prepared and discuss it and we can just vote on it. So that shouldn't take up that much time. I'll do all the legwork. You guys just need to listen and do all the approvals. It's just moving, you know, funds from one to another if necessary. So um it can you be ready? To. Can you be ready for next week? Yeah. Yeah, if we have to, yeah. We'll have to do a little projecting, but we can make it happen. Well, I, I guess that's up to you. I don't know what you have to do. So you tell us what you need. Is then Linda still on? Because Linda gave a good um, update of what she thinks is going to, where we're going to end up. But um, yeah, I mean, if you guys, can you get the finance committee on board too next week? That's probably going to push it, I think. Right. So, and we're saying that we don't want to do the sixth. Well, we by you whoever suggested it. Can you hear about the microphone? Yeah. If you were going to do it without um, without having to do projections, it's by the fifteenth that the final bills are paid. Is that right? I mean, <clears throat> is two weeks later still take care of it? No, we have to do it by we have to vote it by the fifteenth. So. Everybody, so if we said we didn't have a meeting until the 13th, um, what would that do for you guys? That that would be perfect because the later the better for me. But okay, if you guys could meet on the 13th instead of the 20th, maybe. Oh, 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 you were thinking the 20th. Okay, I was thinking it would be the 13th. So, oh, because the first and the third, so the sixth, you're, you're right, but they're until the 27th, but they're not doing the first because of Fourth of July, right? So the 13th would be perfect if that could work for the FinCon too. Well, I'm I'm fine with the 29th and the 13th. But if we're doing the 13th, do we need the 29th if the reason that we were doing the 29th was to get it in before the end of the year? Or is there a different reason on top of that? Also, the appointment of committees is for the following starting July 1st. So contain those to the 13th. But I think so. I, I, I think I think so. None of these committees are um, financial or anything like that. They're your volunteer boards and committees. So those can be postponed till the thirteenth. I, I believe so. Carolyn, do you do you have any problem with that? If we wait till the thirteenth. Um, no, 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 no. And it's just a matter of putting out the end of the for each board. That'll give us time. Mm -hmm. right. So motion to have our next meeting on uh, July 13th, 2022. What, what about if we have to call a special town meeting? I thought we were going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks. Carolyn, is that enough time? For the, the water project. Is, is it that time for what? What are you asking me? I'm sorry. I thought we were going to want to meet sooner because of the water uh, project. Well, because exactly otherwise, it's you're talking about three weeks. I, I really have to look at it because I want we need to get time and capital on board as well. Why, why, let's go with the 13th. If we need to pull a meeting together, um, we can always do it midday on Zoom. It doesn't have to be at night. It doesn't have to be on Wednesday. I think there's some flexibility. If there's an extra meeting, we need to put in there. All right. I have a motion from Randy. Right. What about the second meeting? Saying that you want that in the 20th or the 27th for the second meeting? Two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. Get back on schedule. Yeah. 13 and 20. Do we need to have that in the motion or can we just do it? It's I'll, you want me to amend my motion to the 13th and the 20th? I think it's just administrative and we don't need a motion. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hi, Marion. You're here for the climate resolution. Okay, hi. Um, I'll try to be brief. I know you all have been meeting for quite 
a while now. Um, I'm call, um, speaking on behalf of the Hadley Climate Change Committee. Um, we have drafted a resolution declaring a climate emergency. Um, and we're asking that the town sign this declaration. Uh, it has been, we sent you copies and we had it available um, to be looked at. We, we, we were on display at the Asparagus Festival and got feedback from people um, who had a chance to read it. And we had, had some very um, thoughtful conversations about the declaration. Um, it would be of no cost to the town, um, mostly what it would um, be uh, the town deciding that they are going to take uh, climate change seriously, that they are going to uh, declare it as an emergency and that it is a, it's a document that guides our town and uh, helps us to make important decisions about how we, um, about how we're going to protect our town and protect our planet and protect our citizens and our wildlife and our land and our forests. Um, there's about, um, 1900 local governments that have signed the, uh, a similar kind of declaration along with about 34 countries and up to over, including over 20, um, over 20 towns, the last time we checked um, in, in the state of Massachusetts, including Boston, Lexington, Acton, Northampton, Amherst, um, and about 11 towns on the Cape. Um, we all know that there's many things going on, uh, many important um, uh, climate change uh, effects happening all over the world and in this part of the world. And so um, we want this to be just a document that we have and use and refer to and guide us maybe, you know, it's not binding, but guides us and helps us to make important decisions as we move forward in, in our work together. So um, we've already taken some actions. Um, we are moving ahead on the green community designation. Um, we had our first climate day, um, which was very successful. Um, and we continue, we, we, we signed the plastic ban um, and the town is now ready to implement some of the critical um, transitions away from fossil fuels. We've taken steps there um, and to advance a robust carbon-free equitable economy and improve the health and quality of life that will result. Um, so that is why I'm here today is just to let you know that um, we would like the town to sign this and um, join many other uh, communities around the state of Massachusetts. Um, so that's my piece. So in reading this document, it, it appears to me that the, the only thing that the town would be locked into uh, other than agreeing that there's a climate change issue and stuff needs to be done to deal with it, that the climate change committee would work with town officials to try to get grant money or I'll call it free money to the town to put towards trying to eliminate some of these issues. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. It would be of no cost to the town. All right. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Jack Sikowski here with a comment. Randy, we are actively pursuing a green community designation. The town would receive a designation fee from the state of about $130,000 um, if we can get that enacted by the end of the year. We've been working diligently on the five criteria that are expected for that. And is this part of that, Jack? It is. It's the whole package. Everything we're doing 
is for the benefit of the town aiming toward reducing climate change. And, and you're not proposing that we uh, stop farmers from using tractors and things like that, unless there's technology that is financially uh, appropriate for their situation. Randy, every farmer that I know is trying to do everything they possibly can to save some money this summer. Okay. Well, we're hoping, you know, that we can find ways to support our farmers and um, to make certain um, shifts in their practice, but it's not like a, it's in, not in any way sort of a, it's really to support, um, support our farmers in, in practice it in, you know, kind of incentivizing, or I think I have it here. Um, buh, 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 buh. Um, I mean, if there's a certain page, if you tell me, I'm sharing it on the screen. Oh, okay, great. Um, just we wrote down pursuing incentives for farmers to adopt uh, regenerative farming, which includes soil conservation and the sequestration of carbon. But, you know, it's, it's, it's um, seeing if there's incentives out there, you know, um, looking into that, finding ways mm -hmm. to support our farmers, finding ways to... Um, you know, to keep, to preserve our forests so that we can, you know, um, you know, um, sequester carbon, you know, just the, all the different steps that we need to take to mitigate climate emergencies in this town. Would it be appropriate, um, given the nature of this, to consider this a first reading and uh, just give us a chance to think through this and then um, help to adopt this at a subsequent meeting or sometimes that's good. Still, we can set that on the agenda. We can do this as a set and have a separate meeting. We'll put it on the agenda for our next meeting. <laughs> and take a vote on it then. Is that okay for the uh, climate committee sign that as well? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thanks, Molly. Yep. And thank all the climate committee for their work on this. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. All right. We're now at 5.8 communication social media. That is the select board's item to talk about how we want to further continue our goals of improving communication with the town. Oh, we're doing that. Oh. In the spirit of time, do we want to move this to a subsequent agenda and this is incredibly important topic but let's worry about getting it a little bit short shrift. Yeah I, I think that makes sense. Would you like on the 13th? Yes. Randy are you okay with that too and um, Amy? I didn't really hear what you said Molly. You, you guys are a little garbled. I'm fine oh. with that. I was just suggesting that in the spirit of time we move this to a subsequent agenda because otherwise it's an important topic, and I hate to give it short shrift tonight. Um, so maybe we can have a more meaningful discussion when we have more time. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Right. Absolutely not. All right. Carolyn, we'll be right back and we'll talk about the um, accounting contract. Was I clear enough on that one? <laughs> <laughs> IT cemeteries, I'm your girl, but not for the big answer. Carolyn, you're on the account. Talk to you about that. Yes, uh, a couple months ago, um, at the recommendation of Select board, um, we uh, advertised for the position of accountant to see if there was anybody um, who was out there who could literally walk into the job. We wanted to look at both options. We have been very satisfied with the Lanson, but we wanted to just see what was out there. So, um, although we had applicants, 
there was no one that could walk into a municipal position. Those qualifications weren't there, and that is critical. So, um, Lori is here. She must be here. Oh, there. Where's your phone? He's here. Hi, I'm here. Or Lori's here. Um, so I had, um, I did, uh, Jennifer uploaded the contracts to it, so you had a chance to see it. And so um, she has the most recent contract available for you guys to look at, and also ask us any questions you might have. Just a couple of questions. Um, Lori, just one of the things I was wondering is, um, obviously the contract's based on your estimation of a certain number of hours, or is it based on committed and dedicated hours to the town of Hadley? And how, do you, how did you arrive at the contract on that? Um, I, honestly, I didn't come up with the price. Um, so I'm not sure how they calculated that, but we have a, you know, a year of history or so. So um, last year, the contract was 88,000. This year, it's 90. Um, I, I wasn't prepared to answer the number of hours that we spend on Hadley. I could certainly get that for you, but it's not based on the number of hours. It's just on the job, you know, whatever it takes to get the job done. And did the contract, um, and maybe I missed it, but I was just looking for uh, a lot of times you know, when you've done them, it will say that there's a commitment to either be on site a certain number of hours a week or turnaround times, like all of those things. Is that we're, on, yeah, we're on site once a month. And that's, I believe that's, that should be in the contract. Monthly? Yeah, monthly visits. Monthly on site. Is that really often enough? That's a question for you guys. I mean, yeah. we're we're doing it. Well, you know, Linda uh, needs to answer that. Yeah, actually, there's um, it's once a month for the regular for for being on site for uh, department heads and all. But that's in addition to you come to town meetings and you'll, you'll appear at audits of various. Uh, various other things that you do for us so this is just a it's once a month for a regular on-site right visit. right yeah we do 99 percent of our work remotely so when i'm there at town hall that's like to meet with everybody to have meetings all day and yeah that's is just that like enough additional. time is that enough time linda well i i it's I don't wait for that day. I'm on the phone with them a lot, actually. Right. I deal with accountants regularly. Um, they're always available by phone, not just to me. Yep. So they're available for department heads. And uh, we, uh, we have a lot of regular contract uh, contact. So um, I'm, not as, I'm not familiar. Maybe Carolyn's heard from department heads, but um, it, it works for me. I know that we really like having them there. It was great to have, a, you know, a you know, I, I'd love to have Mary once a month and you once a month, Lori. That would be my ideal is ha have each of you. So that would be uh, twice a month because we uh, sometimes we have to choose between you and we really have different things that, that we work with um, with with both of you. But um, but they're you know, we they're available by by phone or Zoom or conference call or email. <laughs> and Lori, please, I mean, everything I've heard um, you know, from the staff and, and the town administrator. It sounds like everybody's really pleased with the work that Melance and Heath is doing. I think I'm just asking questions from a contract standpoint, and I'm realizing now it's probably not fair to ask you those questions. And probably <laughs> to, um, That's okay. Is Tanya still the lead on this? Or she is. Yep. Can yep. We get a Tanya about how that, I just want to better understand how the $90,000 contract was put together. Um, okay. Appropriate to ask you, so my apologies. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I, we can get that information for you, though. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Did you want to wait for questions? Do you want to wait for an issue? And how time sensitive is, I don't want to without a contract with the land. So <laughs> Lori, Lori Tanning is not going to be question that it's going to be joined with the other contract, June 30th. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
long story, I promise it's not to walk out the door. Maybe we can. Or lock the door. No. Those questions are one for the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. We'll put that on our list. The 13th, which y'all will already be here for. If you say that'll work. Yes. Or are you not? <laughs> and this will be quick. Um, we went out uh, with a request for proposals. How many did it have requested the same amount? Uh, I'm trying to think how many requested. Um, we actually we received, I believe it was six requests for general, but only five for labor. Okay. What came back was we uh, got, uh, so if you remember, just, uh, just to summarize. Um, we have had one um, firm for about 20 years. Um, this is the first time we've been out to bid, I think, in that, amount, in that time frame. And uh, we were in agreement to do general as well as labor two seconds. <coughs> so we have, um, we have three um, firms that reply for uh, labor. We have two that replied for general, and I would like to give to you. You have the proposals. Uh, they are I would tell you these are very very good firms. <coughs> but if you could, I, I, I'm leaving it to you. How do you decide you want to move forward? I would say interview the firms. Carolyn, I, I think this is um, great that we've gotten the responses. And I would definitely recommend that we bring the firms in for an interview before awarding the bid if that is uh, works for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle as much as coffee. If y'all are okay with that, then Carolyn and I will work on um, reaching out to y'all and the firms to see when um, we'll be good to have them. I do know that Carolyn had a conversation with KQ Law. And since we don't carry a contract with our legal counsel, they have affirmed that they will continue to represent the town of Hadley until the time that we're ready to transition to new counsel. Perfect. So if that's okay with everybody. Okay. So I'll, I'll make, I will praise Carolyn of the rest of the conversation. Okay. Okay. July. Okay. Um, if we do it, if we could do that before then, would that be acceptable as well? Okay. Because um, we were thinking we might try to move it a little quicker. I, I don't want to say that, but perhaps and maybe over Zoom um, during the day or something like that. Um, and and um, but I'll I'll work with Carolyn and we'll be in touch with y'all to make sure that we have it set up appropriately and what works best for everyone. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, there's no other business. Uh, the town administrator's report is basically end of year cleanup and contracts. So you've already heard all of that from her. Are there any announcements? Announcements? Uh, I had a couple of announcements. Uh, on the happy side, we have Mr. Thomas Zusfeld, and he is a 20 acre farm. He has been there for 57 years and started his business, and Tom has turned 90 years old today, and he works every day still. So, on that tractor, he's in the greenhouses. Um, so, much happy birthday, Tom. Uh, hope you have many more. Still up, and uh, away you go. <laughs> Sad note, we have uh, two condolences this evening. One of uh, Robert Bullock, Bob. Um, he was a farm manager from the Lake Farm um, with the cows. Uh, took a lot of pride in his Swiss Cow Association. He was president of the Swiss Cow Association. Uh, so condolences to his children. Sean worked on the farm with him, with his family there. And he has a son, Bob, and a uh, son. So condolences to his family. Condolences to Greg Mish's family. Greg, uh, long time uh, 
I'm going to say 40 years on the Board of, uh, Board of Health. Uh, he did most of the Title V uh, applications, and uh, he's just been a quiet guy. They ran fish farming potatoes and packing company uh, for quite a number of years. I also have two donations for uh, Ruth Moore, the loss of her husband, when they were active here at the senior center. And on the good news, in Yankee Magazine, Maple Valley Creamery, the scoop, made, was voted, they made the best ice cream in New England out of a list of 36. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, bring people to town. Yeah. That's great. I yeah. think the taco truck there is quite amazing too. Randy, Amy, anything from you? Nope. I'm good, thank you. Oh, nope. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Amy. Roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Nevinson? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Kaiser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night. You, you too. too. Thank you. Thank you.